Okay, well, good morning, uh, everyone, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, this is a little bit like being on uh, TV, only uh, better since, since the people watching can interact and ask questions. Anyway, I'd like to thank Jerry for, the, for suggesting the uh, topic that I'm discussing today, uh, which is mostly the work of others. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is what is uh, referred to as the world's largest uh, X-ray spectroscopy database uh, in the materials project. I think that's correct, a, a true statement. Uh, it has two parts. One, I'm going to discuss uh, how we do these fast throughput calculations of uh, X-ray spectra in the materials project. So uh, one is uh, a brief summary of the theory that is used in the FEF code to do this, and then how the database was constructed. And then uh, in the last part of the talk, I'm going to discuss a couple applications uh, that have recently been developed. These are basically machine learning methods that have been applied for structure identification. And then uh, some comments on possible future work. Okay, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the materials project, although most people are, this was started uh, about seven or eight years ago. This is by uh, Cedar and uh, Kristen Pearson. Uh, there's a wonderful Scientific American article, which uh, you may have seen. In any case, the goal is the computation of the properties of all materials, which is aimed to accelerate innovation in materials research. And I'm not gonna really discuss everything they're doing. Uh, basically, the focus on uh, X-ray spectroscopy. So if I go to their link, and hopefully this will work. Here we go. Can everybody see this? I hope so. Uh, hey, John, okay. you'll have to, you'd have to change your share to show us um, uh, a window that popped up. Oh, let's see. Change my share. Yeah, so you'll have to stop share and then share again. And slideshow? No, just, uh, just stop share. I think it's uh, display setting. So if you just move your mouse around, you should see uh, um, up at the top of your screen, probably a little red field that says stop share. Yeah, but it doesn't. Uh, I don't see this thing. Uh, you may have to hit escape then. That seemed to work for you last time. Okay. All right, yeah, now you can share that other window. Okay. Share screen. There we go. Okay, I hope this won't take too long. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay, so I've gone to the main screen in the materials project, and we'll clip on, click on some material that we want. Uh, our guinea pig in FEF is always copper. So we'll search on copper. And I like MP30, which is the standard FCC copper spectrum. And bingo, we see a list of all the properties you ever wanted to know. Uh, crystal structure, diffraction patterns, and oh, here we are, X-ray spectra. And this looks like the K edge of copper. Uh, so they did a calculation. Uh, now this calculation, if you look at the bottom, has a warning. It's, it's semi-quantitative. They didn't put in edge shifts or the by waller damping. But you can do that because you can download the input file uh, for FEF and then do whatever you want. So, uh, okay, let's go back. And screen sharing stop. I'm going to... 
share my screen again and go back to you yeah you're not uh, projecting so we may have to anyway go ahead and project and let's see what happens okay share screen it's not working this minute Okay, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> no worries. Okay, here we are. And can we share screen again? Well, why don't you project it first so that you know which window to pick. Okay. All right, and now um, uh, share screen and choose the uh, uh, other window, or maybe you have to unshare and that, yeah, there you go. Okay, are we back? Perfect. Okay, so. Materials project, here we go. Okay, so what do we want to do? Uh, ideally, what we would like to do is calculate uh, the X-ray absorption spectra, and we're going to focus, at least for starters, on the K edge. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of little wiggles. Everybody who knows uh, X-ray absorption fine structure has known that we're only interested in this wee tiny portion of the full spectrum. Okay, now the uh, the calculations that are in the materials project are described in a couple of publications. Uh, one is in scientific data, and it really gives a, a good overview. This is the reference that was published in 2018. Uh, the algorithms that are used are basically uh, the parameter-free calculations uh, in FEF9. Uh, and that's described in this PCC, Physics, Phys, Chem, Chem, Phys uh, paper, uh, already 10 years old. So why do we use, uh, why is that a good idea for the materials project? Uh, well, one is that it's, uh, it's not a perfect theory, but it's automated and it can be applied right away to anything in the periodic table. That's because it's an all electron code uh, with a relativistic uh, basis. And uh, it, it builds in some many body effects like damping that are essential, uh, that really are essential to understanding X-ray spectra that have these damping effects. This is illustrated in this slide. Uh, the effect data, by the way, came from Matt Nuda. There are two references that uh, uh, to the FEF theory. Uh, one is our reviews of modern physics back in 2000. That's a pretty dated. This was updated in 2009 uh, with uh, improved treatment of many body effects. And I recommend both of these uh, reviews for details on FEF. What's the difference between FEF and other codes for calculating spectra? One is that uh, the FEF code is a real space Green's function approach. It doesn't use wave functions at all. In fact, our motto is to skip wave functions. Uh, the reason is that it's a, the use of wave functions like in Fermi's golden rule is not efficient computationally, it's in fact, it's a computational bottleneck because first of all, you have to calculate all these final states, all their eigenvalues, then sum them all up. So it's, it's kind of a, called a sum over states method. And it's just numerically inefficient. On the other hand, if you go to a Green's function approach, you get a formula that has a single matrix element of a Green's function. These are equivalent 
formulation. And moreover, uh, it's actually easier to add many body effects in a Green's function because uh, the Hamiltonian is, is not just the uh, single particle DFT Hamiltonian, but it's the final state Hamiltonian in the presence of a core hole and uh, with a photoelectron that has a self energy. So this is an improvement, it's really an improved theory. Proved, it's a one electron theory, a quasi particle theory, but it does a much better job than uh, wave function methods. So just briefly to summarize the theory, theoretical ingredients in FEF, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but to show what we need. First of all, as I said, it's an all electron code. More, moreover, it's fully relativistic. Uh, so at its heart is a Dirac Bach atomic code uh, from the CLO uh, that Alexion Kudinov extended uh, to make it an effective one electron code. So it's very fast to calculate. We have relativistic uh, atom properties, potentials, and phase shifts. And that's really crucial to get deep core level uh, energies uh, approximately right. We include the core hole, uh, which is screened, either DFT screening or uh, uh, RPA. Uh, that's also important. And we have a mean free path and self energy uh, shifts built in uh, to the theory automatically. So uh, uh, this, this shows up as kind of systematic uh, shifts in the peak positions and damping of the peak position. We're going to ignore, or at least the materials project ignores the Bywaller effects, uh, which give a temperature dependent of the spectra and uh, satellites. These are kind of small in the near edge uh, region. So uh, that's a reasonable approximation. But as I said, you can always put them in later if you want, by uh, downloading the PEF.input file from the materials project and rerunning uh, your own version of PEF with these factors. What does the self-energy do? As I said, uh, it gives a systematic shift. This is the behavior of the real part, eventually uh, uh, goes smoothly uh, up, and the imaginary part builds, it, builds up too over an energy region of order omega p, the plasmon energy is about 20 volts. So in the first 10, 15 volts, you can get away with uh, uh, DFT-like uh, effects as long as you have an inner potential, but then you have to uh, have energy dependence. Okay, so this is the uh, end of part one, and I can take some questions. All right, I'll give just a second for people to put questions into chat. Uh, so far, very smooth, John. All right, I think you should, uh, you should continue. No questions, okay. All right, so the second part is the implementation in the materials project. Uh, as, uh, as I noted, one of the reasons for using FEF is that it's, it's automated and it can work in auto arbitrary systems throughout the periodic table. In fact, we've actually included uh, in the next version of FEF uh, possibility of calculating up to Z equals 138. Why would you want to do that? Well, I don't know, but uh, uh, theoretically it's possible. So FEF has, as I said, it's a pretty good theory. It's, it's not as good as, say, beta saltpeter uh, or other more elaborate theories, but uh, it's pretty good. Let's say it's a 90% theory. It has very low computational cost, so in a few minutes you can calculate almost anything. Uh, there are only a few adjustable parameters. The adjustable parameters are just like the radius of the cluster, the number of atoms you include, et cetera. And just like Beth, you take some input file which describes the material, uh, the coordinate, Cartesian coordinates of the atoms and their atomic numbers. It constructs relativistic self-consistent potentials, uh, phase shifts, 
and then does its real space Green's function with either a path expansion for x axis or full multiple scattering for the near edge and produces the structure following the algorithms in this uh, PCCP article that I made. And this is the workflow that's been described in the uh, data science article. So they use the vast code to calculate the uh, uh, structure given a given crystal structure. And then they uh, take that structure and run FEF. And then with that uh, output from the X-ray spectra, they put it into a, a database. OK, as I said, there were a couple parameters in the calculations. Uh, one is in the construction of the self-consistent potential, you have to describe, you have to pick a radius, the number of uh, small number of atoms that uh, surround the absorber to construct the potential. They're, they've used extremely conservative values. Uh, they use a, a self-consistent Muffington radius, not Muffington radius, cluster radius of six angstrom. It's really overkill. Uh, you could get by with uh, maybe four and a half and do just as well. Uh, similarly, for the full multiple scattering calculations, they went up to nine, which is uh, several hundred atoms. Usually we can get convergence with about 150 atoms in fact. But again, they were conservative, and so they set it equal to nine, just to, so it would work everywhere. Uh, you, can, you can relax that, in my humble opinion, and do almost as well. Probably won't notice. Okay, one of the things about the vast calculations is that it's built on top of some DFT uh, functional. There are functionals like PBE Sol or uh, some, uh, uh, some others compared to the crystallographic coordinates, and they always give some error in the lattice constant. It's typically a few percent. Uh, low, like this. It can be high, but but it's low. Anyway, uh, the functionals never give the exact uh, lattice constant. Is this a problem? Well, I claim that it's not a problem, I and mean, they show that it's not a problem. So, what's the effect of the lattice parameter on the zane? Suppose you don't know the lattice constant. Well, you go ahead and do the calculation, and this is a calculation in some typical material. What you see is if you vary the lattice constant by plus or minus 5%, I don't think you can see much difference in the spectrum. It basically just shifts around. And the reason for that is uh, uh, that theoretically, the calculations actually scale with distance. They scale inversely. So that uh, as you increase the lattice constant, the, uh, the structure shrinks. This is called the store natoli rule. Uh, and you can determine bond length by how uh, this structure changes. But what you see is that the structure doesn't change uh, very much. It just shifts around. And if, if you're doing structure identifications, uh, you probably don't, don't even notice that that much. Although this little shift uh, can be important, the shift between here and here, these, these two peaks, is actually indicative of the uh, the distance between uh, the near neighbors. Okay, so they do this, and then they run it through their database, which has uh, quite a few structures. Uh, everything is automated, and uh, they went through sixty thousand structures. And they got 600,000 K edge uh, vein spectra, 200,000 eel spectra. And uh, as I mentioned before, they included the input output files uh, so that you can actually uh, take that test.input and do whatever you want. Uh, 
the original MP database only has K edge data, even for heavy atoms, although we would have recommended L3. Uh, but that's what they have. And that's the status of uh, uh, the database right now. But in a few weeks, and that few weeks uh, is updated every few weeks, so stay tuned. Uh, they're going to have L-Edge data uh, on the site. So uh, right now there's uh, about 140,000 L-Edge spectra and uh, this is coming soon. I'm told by my uh, collaborators, these are uh, scientists at uh, UCSD, Choi Ting Ong and uh, grad students at Yi Ming Chen. I'll show a couple of them. They were uh, kind enough to give me a preview. So these are some L-edge spectra. You can see the L2 and L3 here. Uh, Beth isn't as good as it, as it is in the K-edge, uh, but it's not completely horrible. It gives uh, one an idea. And this could be improved, but uh, it may be good enough for uh, rough work. Also coming soon is uh, the extension to XAV, not just the mirror edge spectra. And so what you can do, in fact, you can do this too with, uh, with Beth, you can stitch uh, a Zane's calculation to an XAV calculation around three to 3.5 uh, angstrom by uh, just kind of a linear interpolation. Uh, this stitching algorithm is described uh, by uh, uh, Rangi at all in uh, back in 2009. So uh, I recommend that, but it's, uh, it's coming soon. Okay, and now we're at the second question period. Okay, we have a, um, a few questions. Uh, Anatoly, uh, would you like to unmute? Uh, no, it's okay, Jerry. You can ask my question. Oh, all right. Uh, what tolerance is used for definition of equivalent sites? And he mentions DFT structures are relaxed. Uh, did you hear me, John? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, you blinked. You said you had a few questions. Yeah. Uh, what tolerance is used for definition of equivalent sites? And the comment is DFT structures are relaxed. Say that again. What tolerance is used for the definition of quote equivalent sites unquote? Um, John, it's I can't not really remember. Actually, uh, sorry to say, uh, uh, that there's some tolerance. Uh, I, I'm I'm sorry, I do, just don't remember the details. Uh, send me an email, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll check that. All right, good. Um, it's a few percent or something like that, or one percent. I, I don't remember. Okay, uh, Matthew Marcus, uh, you've got a question. Yes. I was wondering uh, whether the uh, database also includes the, uh, the spectra for not just the metals, for instance, in an oxide, but the light elements too. Like in nickel oxide, does it have you know, does it have the oxygen as well as the as the nickel? I thought so. Yeah, I haven't checked. And how well does FEF do on the on the light elements anyway? Ter terrible on some, uh, like uh, alumina or something like that. It actually does quite well in the XAFs, but... Uh, what uh, about Zanes? Well, on some materials, it does very badly. You need very large unit cells and uh, maybe full potential. So, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, it fails in the normal way for some light elements, and then, then it gets others like diamond pretty well. Uh, uh -huh. Ah, yeah, so, I have a particular project in mind which involves oxygen fluorine edges in, in the nickel oxygen fluorine system. Well, that might work okay. 
a anytime you have kind of large unit cells, uh, it does okay. Uh, large spacing, close pack things like in silica, it does badly. Well, anyway, this is this is just a quick rough calculation, and it's not meant to do everything. When FEF fails, you you need a beta sulfate code, and uh -huh. something like that. Yeah, and is there a, does the CF average card work? Well, if it doesn't, let us know. Okay, I'd heard that it, did, that it didn't work properly. Could be. Uh, okay, uh, Adam Hitchcock, you've got a question. Do you have your mic? Yes, I've unmuted. Uh, un sorry. Hi, John. Uh, great hey, talk. Hi. I was uh, interested in your comment on slide 17 with respect to the uh, shift because of lattice expansion or contraction and then using bond length for the ruler type concepts. Uh, we had that actually uh, in a three or four talks ago, I can't remember exactly which one it was, being actually applied to uh, uh, improve matches to experimental spectra and uh, as a way of getting some structural information. How common is that? And is that a uh, type of adjustment built into the materials project protocols? Well, it should be more common. Uh, what I think the machine learning has figured out is that it actually works pretty well, uh, at least for near neighbor uh, identification. So uh, I think it's becoming more used, but uh, we've known about it for ages and ages. And uh, I guess people just get used to using uh, the sort of standard analysis tools like uh, Matt and Bruce Ravel have developed and uh, well, uh, that's my, that's, I don't have a good reason for why it's not used. I think it should be. I think it's a great idea. All right, then, um, uh, John, you should continue. Okay. Okay, so, uh, this brings me to the last part, and it's, uh, again, a method that's being uh, developed uh, by the people in the materials project and others. Uh, there are two papers I would like to refer people to. Uh, one is, uh, I think this is 2018. I don't have the date on it yet. Uh, which talks about a way of doing uh, machine learning to match X-ray spectra to a given material. And then recently, recently being uh, yesterday, uh, an article appeared in Patterns, uh, Volume 1, uh, on their random forest model for accurate identification of the spectra. So uh, you have to look this up, but uh, you'll find it in, in my talk or just Google Patterns 1, uh, May 8, 2020. Uh, but as I said, there are other works. So this, this comes from the Brookhaven group, Timoshenko, Anatoly, and Beju Beju, uh, another machine learning uh, algorithm. There's uh, others being developed, for example, at Toyota Research. So uh, how well does it work? So this is a, an algorithm called ELSI, Ensemble Learn, Learning Algorithm. And it actually had the goal of matching experimental spectra to structure in the database. And to make a long story short, what they found, and the, here they use this Pearson coefficient, basically uh, a correlation between the uh, uh, distances of two spectra, distance between two spectra. What they find is that uh, it's about 80% 80, 80 efficient uh, to ident for identification of the coordination environment based on 
F9 and then the structures. So it's not too bad. Uh, I mean, 84% without even doing anything. It's, uh, it's great for a screening, rough screening. This is the new, new work, uh, as I said, May 8, 2020. And uh, it's a slightly, it's a more advanced technique. These random forest models are basically ensembles with uh, various the Shizen trees uh, extracted from subsets of the data. And uh, again, they're able to get identified about a couple hundred thousand with over 80% uh, accuracy. This is the workflow. Again, I refer you to the paper for, uh, for details. And I, I like these techniques. I think they're uh, going to be increasingly important. In my humble opinion, we could make them even better by uh, perhaps teaching these machine learning uh, systems some laws of physics and also they can't uh, uh, predict some structures that uh, uh, are really out of bounds. So, uh, but, I, but I think they're great. And again, could be extremely useful in industry or other places where they need to screen a whole bunch of materials quickly to get started. What's there for the future? Uh, well, as I said, the materials project is continuing to uh, improve the X-ray spectra calculation. The initial uh, database was just the K-edge, but the L-edge and x -edge is being added soon. And it wouldn't be very difficult to in include, I'd say, what I call the full spectrum going from the UV to the X-ray absorption uh, edge. So that's a few EV to uh, 100,000 EV. That's already been done in uh, Micah Prangy's uh, thesis work back in 2009. And we could add all of the optical constants, dielectric function, absorption, react reflectivity, et cetera. Uh, in Micah's paper, you can see some examples. This is alumina uh, loss function and uh, indexal refraction. Well, you know, you can say this is not great, but it's really not too bad. If you just want to get a rough idea of the loss function and the reflectivity, this is probably good enough for a lot of uh, applications. And if you want to do better, then you need to run some sophisticated beta saltpeter code that takes a hundred times uh, longer. So that's what I think uh, is possible, at least uh, with the FEF code. Uh, I don't know if many people know it, but there is an OpCons extension to FEF. It's only uh, partially implemented in uh, FEF 9. Uh, there's an auxiliary code that's available on request. Uh, that uh, they can do this uh, full spectrum calculation. And that's it. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators in the materials project. I'm just an advisor. These guys did all the work, uh, although Josh Cass has also contributed to uh, uh, the work in determining those default uh, parameters. And uh, funding came from NSF, and various computer centers and the PEF project, we have to acknowledge has been supported by the DOE Office of Science, Basic Energy Sciences, Theoretical Condensed Matter Physics uh, grant for uh, many years. And I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and I can accept any other questions at this time. Thank you, John. Um... A couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, someone's curious, does FEF have a parallel, a parallel version? Absolutely. FEF runs in parallel. In fact, we recommend it. If you run it with MPI, uh, let's say 20 processors, you can do a calculation in 10 minutes. It would otherwise take uh, an hour. 
or two. So uh, yes, yeah, theft runs in parallel. It's been parallelized for a long time. Okay. It naturally um, parallelizes, let me put it that way. Because of the Green's function method without wave functions, all you have to do is specify uh, energies and you can give a different energy to a different processor and calculate them all at once. Very good. Um, so it, uh, if there's a large database, let's say of UV properties, then you can imagine that uh, some company or individual who wants to find a material with particular UV properties um, uh, would find that terrifically helpful. Um, uh, where do you see, on the other hand, the X-ray absorption, the Zanes, uh, is going to have different uses. Uh, what do you think are going to be a couple of the most prominent uses of the uh, this uh, large database of Zane's calculations? Well, you know, I'm a theorist, uh, so uh, what surprises me is is all the uses that they found. I mean, there's tremendous applications in catalysis, in battery research, all these specialized materials which are going to really save our save us, I believe, uh, come from fancy new materials. So I can't speculate, but uh, uh, really the only way to understand the local structure of a material is with x-rays. And uh, what we need to do is have better tools for deciphering what's in things. And I think a combination of theory and experiment, not just machine learning, but machine learning plus a little bit of physics, uh, we can we can improve things uh, even more. I don't know. I maybe others would comment on that, but uh, that's always been my uh, premise. Okay, um, uh, Matt Newville, would you like to ask your question? Uh, you're muted, Matt. All right, I'll ask on his behalf, uh, uh, are there any efforts you know of to compare the Zanes calculations to experimental spectra, and can we make that happen? Uh, there are several. I mean, I think there were some uh, default spectra for a number of materials that, uh, and, and actually the materials project now has a, uh, a way to import some experimental spectra. So that's coming. I, I think we really need to have a big database of experimental spectra that's a vetted. Uh, uh, I think that would be that would be really great. What maybe I should ask you guys, I mean, since you guys are making all the spectra, uh, what's the status of that? Uh, I think it'd be really interesting to uh, try and make uh, oh Matthew, go ahead. I just, yeah, I, I think it'd be interesting to try that, and it would be. I didn't know that the materials project was a, was taking experimental spectra, but there are some efforts uh, to make databases, but uh, of experimental spectra. But I don't know anyone who's actually comparing those to to these calculations right now. Uh, but it'd be interesting to try. Well, thank you. And in fact, I think this is a, I will pass that on to the materials people and, and we'll try to, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on what they, they're uh, planning to do. Maybe it's not really implemented yet, but it's on the drawing boards. And I think we really need this. We need to, to vet the spectra. So then we know how good or, or horrible theft is and what else we can do to, uh, to improve it. Okay. Um, we have a question about uh, um, uh, how you think this approach could be used to try to help with high entropy materials. High entropy materials? Yeah, high entropy alloys is a lot of work on this. Uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, obviously, these don't have a definite crystal structure. They're, they're mixtures. I think, though, it gives you a starting point. Mm -hmm. 
I don't have a, a, a simple answer there because it's, this is something you have to play with. But maybe the materials project should could have a, a few alloys in its uh, database so that uh, uh, one can look at them. Certainly, with BEF, you can you can make these uh, high entropy materials without any problem. You just basically uh, cook up a structure with a given entropy. By entropy, what I mean is a given distribution of near neighbors, second neighbors, etc. That defines a, a structure. So, uh, yeah, lots to lots to do. It's a, it's a good question. There are lots of materials, of course. There are an infinite number of materials that are not in the database that you can conceive of. These trace element materials, these are extremely important, but uh, hard to uh, put in a database like that. I see. I see. So, uh, for example, adding to the database uh, typical dopants. Um, in uh, in crystal structures, things like that would be a, a, an expansion. Yes, I see. Um, but, the th but the thing is, Jerry, uh, is what I said. You can download the structure in the database, and then you cook up your own uh, high entropy material starting from that. So that's the great thing about their database. They give you the structures uh, for starters, and then you can uh, play. I see. Um, there's a question about whether the database has molecular materials that being organic compounds. Um, I, I'm not sure to what extent they have that. Uh, I think it was mostly crystal structures, but you know, I'm not an expert. When I use the database, I'm a solid state uh, physicist. I mostly look on the crystals, uh, but I've gotten more into molecules, so I I don't think I've seen the molecular uh, structures. But, but that's a good suggestion. I'll mention that to them. I think it would be a great way. They could add millions of structures. 